Hello, it is my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Norman Solomon for today's event, Reading Intolerant Texts in a Tolerant Society. Rabbi Norman Solomon gained a teaching diploma at Bristol University and ARCM in composition, a bachelor's music degree from London, and in 1961, a rabbinical diploma from Jews College, London. In the summer vacation of 1953, he spent some weeks at Gateshead Yeshiva. Rabbi Norman Solomon is a great professor and author, and we are honored to have him here today. Oh, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Pam, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I was going to say good morning, but it's not relevant for all present. I think some are good morning, some are good afternoon. There are people to the east of me as well and some are good lunchtime. But without any further ado, let me bring up my presentation for you and we will start. See, but before I really get onto Torah values, I want to talk about age and about getting old. Uh, don't be frightened of getting terribly old. I mean, like I am myself, because there are lots of advantages. And one of the great advantages of getting old is that you see that change is for real. Things really do change over periods of time. Let me go through what's happened in my own lifetime. When I was an undergraduate at, the, at uh, Cambridge here, I had friends who were working on something which they called computers. These were huge machines occupying a room or a building, and they certainly didn't do as much as the watch on your wrist does nowadays. And there's been a complete uh, transformation there. Information at our fingertips, information that would only have been a wild dream in earlier times. Instantaneous communication. We had instantaneous communication. We lay cables across the Atlantic for our telephone calls. But as you all know, instantaneous communication is much more readily available, much cheaper, much more widespread. Globalization has taken, uh, has increased at a remarkable rate. We've become aware of climate change. I was out walking uh, uh, yesterday and helped myself to blackberries off the bush, which was fine because it's almost the end of August. But I remember in my early days, in my childhood, going out and collecting blackberries. You wouldn't go to a September. This year we've had them in July, and that can only be because the climate here is changing and getting basically warmer. People have become much more conscious of their dependence on others all around the world. Social attitudes have changed. Racism, when I was a child, was uh, sort of fairly well accepted. I mean, we, everybody knew white people were superior to black in general terms and, and so on. Um, this is uncomfortable for Jews because people try to pick on us as being an inferior people with the results which are well known in the Second World War, which I'll come to. Gender equality. This came home to me in the early 1980s. Of course, I had a wife and that was fine. And she was in charge of me. I knew that and my mother, uh, of blessed memory, may she be, uh, um, she was still around. But then uh, the people above me in the social stakes were Margaret Thatcher, who ruled, the, who controlled the country. I won't say ruled because we also had Her Majesty the Queen at the head of, as the head of state. So um, yes, uh, gender equality was certainly coming and it came and it's come to stay, we hope. But there were events, and the events which have taken place, World War II, again, a transformation of the world and the relationships between nations. The Holocaust, which was uh, the most tragic event in, in, in our history, and indeed in world history, because it was part of world history and has change the world as people have come to a realization of what took place. Foundation of the State of Israel, 
just a dream a few generations ago, and it's there, and it's strong. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the United Nations in 1948. People since the time of Isaiah, and uh, I could cite um, wise men from other parts of the world as well, have dreamt of all nations being united. But to actually implement that in political form is a great development. The collapse of Russian communism in 1989, another very significant event, and not to speak of the huge medical and scientific advances, and all that in my own lifetime. Now, just think how the world and our awareness of the world has changed since the time of the rabbis who defined what we understand as Orthodox Judaism. And if that is great, go back uh, another thousand years or so to the days of Moshe Rabbeinu, a different world, or of Abraham Avinu, still different. So change has taken place. Now, what has change got to do with our topic today? Again, an incident in my own lifetime, a summer's day, sometime in the 1990s, it must have been, early 1990s. And I dropped into a, a local synagogue uh, where a friend of mine was a rabbi and listened to the sermon. And a very nice sermon, quite inspiring. Would have gone down very well with Uri Litzedek. We Jews, we are tolerant uh, much more than other great people. And we don't try to convert anyone or impose our religion in any way. We have never persecuted others, and we've got to be sort of extend our, our benevolence to, to all people. This was the topic of the sermon. And as is usual in synagogues, the service was followed by a kiddush. So I went up to my friend the rabbi and congratulated him. He was a very good speaker and said, uh, thank you very much for the sermon. You also read the Torah very nicely this morning. But I can't put the two together, because what I read in the parasha, which we all read a week or so ago, uh, about tolerance, it didn't seem to be very tolerant. You must destroy all the sites at which the nations you are to dispossess worship their gods on lofty mountains, hills, under any luxuriant tree, tear down their altars, smash their pillars, and so on. That doesn't seem to fit with, with, with the message of tolerance. And if that's not enough, I mean, go back a bit. What we read a few weeks ago in chapter 3 of Devarim, when we were told actually to exterminate all the people, including women and children of the, 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 the nations towards whom we were hostile. How do you put that together with the sermon? And he looked very surprised. He'd never sort of actually read the Torah in that sort of way and hadn't sort of quite sunk in. Anyway, we remain good friends. And I hope that he found some way out of the difficulty. But it doesn't stop there. If we find uh, examples of general intolerance in, in, in the Torah, very strict laws. Look at, the, at the, some of the laws which are there. For how many things can you be chayav mitzah? Can you be put to death? Well, there are 36 things which you can be chayav karet, the Mishnah tells us. I'm not quite sure how many of those are actually mitat bet din. But look at some of the examples. Somebody is machal shabbat, put him to death, stone him to death. I don't think anybody does that nowadays. Um, or something like that. If you make incense according to the formula reserved for the sanctuary, well, I don't think you're likely to do that. Homicide, okay, and there are still several states in, in the United States where, where capital punishment is meted out to homicides. You know, it usually takes a long time. A whole variety of sex offenders, including male homosexuals, or to be stoned or burned or whatever it is, according to the offense, and the rebellious child. So what do we do with all this? How do we explain it? And how do we, despite this, proclaim 
how tolerant we are and how benevolent to other people. Well, uh, there is another side to it. Uh, we can look for other quotations. Uh, don't oppress a, train, a stranger. You know the soul of the stranger, you are strangers in the land of Egypt. The Levite and the fatherless and the widow, they shall all come and eat their fill, look after everybody. And the psalm, which we say in Shakrit every morning, the Lord who made heaven and earth and secure something for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, who sets free the, the bound, who gives sight to the blind, raises, watches over the stranger and all this sort of thing. So, and the Torah, as we know, is full of this. So how do we put the two together? Now, first point then will be that we find various sets of values in the text of, of Torah. And there is a tension, undoubtedly. But we have to find in each generation which set of values which is being forward is relevant to the particular time and place in which we live, and we have to proclaim it accordingly. But let's move on. And let's see that there are other conflicts in the, at least in Tanakh, if not in the Torah itself. And I have picked out one of them because it concerns the status of foreigners. And this is a very important thing because if I uh, look at the program of Uri Litzedek, quite clearly the benevolence, the charity is to be extended to all people, irrespective of, of race, uh, not just to Jews. But there had a tension developed between the universalist and the more nationalistic perception of Torah, and it developed already in the time of Tanakh. Uh, here are a few quotes to illustrate it. From Ezra and Nehemiah, they are the ones to take the, the narrower view. Um, random verses here. Uh, if you see a number like this on top, it corresponds to notes which, uh, which I've sent out, the section three. Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, we have in Ezra chapter two, uh, people are coming back from Babel to Eretz Israel, and they're being sorted out according to their tribes and uh, who they are. And there among them there are Kohanim. Kohanim are going to be needed for the re-established temple. Who, who are going to be taken as Kohanim to officiate in the temple? Well, um, presumably families of Kohanim came back, and they had documents to prove their status. But some didn't have the right documents. Some of them looked for their documents, which gave their yichus. Everybody knows the word yichus. Their relationships demonstrated their descent. But they couldn't be found. By a girl in Menachuna, they were rejected from the priesthood. Understandable. But, it, but the emphasis on yichus and on descent goes much further than that and it seems that one of the big troubles in the eyes or in the view of of both Ezra and Nehemiah were the foreign wives that people had come back with or brought with or, or married while they were there whatever it is and strong exception was taken to this and strong measures were taken the foreign wives and their children were to be sent away. Uh, uh, quite an extreme measure when you think about it. Here are people with wives and families and they're told, oh, you can't have foreign wives who are not of, of proof, demonst demonstrable Israelite uh, descent. Get rid of them and they send them away. Just imagine that happening. Then, uh, on the other hand, we have Deutero Isaiah, I, so I refer to the last passages of Isaiah, who seems to take quite a different view, a much more universalist view on who is going to be counted 
in the community who is going to be significant. And um, actually, this is my what I call my favorite haftarah in Isaiah 56. And uh, what does he say? Um, Neither let the stranger who's that he's joined himself to the Lord. Let him not say, the Lord has separated me from his people. Gosh, this is precisely what Ezra and Nehemiah were saying. These strangers, they've got to be separated from the people. Isaiah is saying, no, let not the stranger say, the Lord has separated me from his people. Let not the eunuch, that means the one who doesn't have a family at all. And um, you know the emphasis which is placed in many Jewish circles on family is very important. And Isaiah's addressing I had to say, let him not say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord to the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. To them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. They're all to be welcomed. And even more, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord. And the word there is hanechag, meaning somebody of a foreign nation. If he joins himself to the Lord and serves him and loves the name of the Lord to be his servant, and so on. Even then, when I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, they will enter the temple. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted. And in fact, he even goes on to say, to suggest that they might become priests, which is truly revolutionary and absolutely contrary to everything that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were saying. Um, also, look at books such as Ruth and Jonah, which put forward this message. Well, so what happens? Situations do change. And what is relevant in one period, one situation, may not be relevant in another. And it places an enormous responsibility on us to be able to choose what are the relevant values for our own type and place. OK, I can say this as somebody living in the 21st century. Am I the first person to notice these sort of conflicts of values? Not at all. The rabbis were there first and they were worried. They didn't spin it out in the way that I might know because they didn't have the same consciousness of changing perspectives in history. And they were concerned to demonstrate unity of Torah. But um, they were aware of difficulties. So let's take some. The first one, the first example I've got is the Ben Sorero Moreh. And here's a passage from Tosefta, Ben Sorero Moreh. The rebellious child, read in Deuteronomy chapter 21, stubborn and rebellious son. Um, I mean, you can't really imagine that because a child has eaten too much or being rather gluttonous, that his parents are going to take him along and get him stoned by all the people of the city. It does seem pretty bad to us, and evidently it did to the rabbis. So you get the following approach. Ben Sororo More, this is Tosefta. Ben Sororo More, lo haya v'lo liyot. Didn't never happen. And it's, it won't come about. But in that case, why put it there? Well, lama nektav, why is it written? Loma drosh for kabasakar, because to study it, you can study the details of what might have been and, and you receive a reward simply for studying, not for putting it into practice because it won't be put into practice. Um, but not everybody actually agrees with that, if you see how the matter is treated in the Gemara uh, in Sanhedrin 71. Rabbi Yonatan actually go, goes on to say, oh yes, it has happened. I was there. Uh, uh, I mean, I, not, not I was there when it happened, but I stood upon his grave. So, uh, I don't know the historical veracity of that. And he says the same thing uh, about another case, which is never supposed to have happened, which is the, the, um, the city which is destroyed on account of idolatry. So this is the approach the rabbis take here. 
to say, well, it couldn't possibly have happened. And the halakha is developed in such a way as to make it impossible. Among the conditions for Ben Sora and Amore would be would be that both the father and the mother have to have uh, the same voice and the same stature and the same appearance, which is sort of pretty unlikely. Um, and various other conditions are made which could not be met. My other example is what I think is one of the greatest revolutions that have taken place in the rabbinic period, though it's, it goes unmentioned in his, most history books. And it concerns Yehud, somebody called Yehuda Geir Amoni, Judah the Ammonite Stranger. Uh, oh dear. He came to the Beit Midrash, and the time that he came to the Beit Midrash was a time when Rabbi Gamliel, that is Gamliel II, at Yavne, shortly before the year 100, had been temporarily deposed. But he was present. And uh, a number of cases were decided, which uh, he laid down the law before, and people, were, the sages were rebelling against this. So this Yehuda, who says, proclaims himself as a gayer, as a convert, the word has subtly changed its meaning from stranger or foreigner to convert. He was an Ammonite convert, claimed he was an Ammonite and he was a convert. And he comes and must have come and presented himself from the better midrash and said, "Ma ani lavo bakahal? What am I? Uh, what about me entering the congregation?" Which is a way of saying, "Am I allowed to marry a native-born Jewish woman?" Rabban Gamliel said, "Asur, no, it's forbidden." The Torah, after all, says, "Lo yavo hamoni umavi bekal Hashem that uh, uh, an Ammonite and a Moabite may not enter the congregation of the Lord." Amalo Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua said, you may, and this is Gamliel deposed, so the case comes before Yeshua, and Yeshua says, it's okay. Gamliel is presented as present, and this is not a history lesson, or I would have a lot of questions to ask. Rabbi Gamliel says, Lo yavo amani? How can you say that? Surely the Torah says quite explicitly an Ammonite, can't enter the congregation of the Lord, even the 10th generation. And to this comes the revolutionary response. Omono Rabbi Yeshua. Ki Ammonim, Ammonim im Koman Hain, are Ammonites and Moabites still in their place? Kva ala Sancherib Melech Ashu, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and mixed up all the nations. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You've got to ask who is saying this and when. Sennacherib was, I don't know, 500 or 700 or something years before this episode. And quite clearly, during the intervening period, uh, everybody thought there were still Ammonites and Moabites around. And Yehuda comes along and says he's an Ammonite. For Rabbi Hoshua to stand up and say this is making a declaration of what I would call universality, of saying, forget all these nations which are mentioned there. We do not recognize them anymore. Yeah, okay, Sennacherib came. But uh, nothing happened in the time of Sennacherib. No rabbi turned round or sage and said, oh, then, then, then it's permitted for an Ammonite to come. This is Rabbi Hoshua in the, the, round about the year 100 who is saying this. So I think it is a very great revolution and a very significant one with regard to the status of nations. Do the rabbis make changes? Well, here are a few of the changes that they made. First of all, again, something which is not often noticed, but they took over from the priests. Everywhere throughout Tanakh, the priests, the Kohanim, are presented as the interpreters of Torah. This stopped, the rabbis took over. There was no reason why Kohanim couldn't have continued, even if there wasn't a temple. But the rabbis, this is called the rabbinic revolution. There was virtual abolition of, of capital punishment, though not of corporal punishment, uh, perhaps uh, enforced by the fact they were living under, under other jurisdiction, but we don't know. But in fact, in practice, um, capital punishment was effectively 
uh, abolished from the time of the rabbis onwards. We do see it in medieval Spain on at least one occasion, but it is something which is very rare in later Judaism. They introduce strict conversion procedures, which haven't existed before, and this changes the meaning of the word geir, because geir comes to mean someone who's been through a formal process of, um, of conversion, whereas earlier on it was not quite like that. Abolition of the sota procedure on the most interesting grounds that um, <laughs> in the Parashat Sota, we get the expression, and uh, if, if the woman proves innocent, and if the nik, if, uh, she shall be cleared of, of her sin, and so on. And the rabbi said, well, yes, um, she shall be cleared of her sin. So that assumes that the man isn't guilty of any sin. So nowadays, that men also are guilty of sins, we can't have this procedure. Something like that happened. Uh, read it in the second Sota. And uh, one which um, I think everybody knows and which uh, takes effect this year, the Rosh Hashanah, in the, the Shemitah year, Hillel introduced the Prospul, the, the Prospulin, the, the, the declaration made in front of, of, the, of the court to enable credit to take place in the seventh year without all debts being cancelled. So the rabbis did change quite a lot because circumstances have changed. They didn't put it like that. They, they uh, make out that they're simply reinterpreting. And something else happens uh, when we examine the, uh, what the rabbis did. Uh, and I've listed six principles. You may find some more. If we were having an in-person meeting, I would simply turn around to you and say, can everybody come up with one of these principles which the rabbis use to um, to sort of, I, I call it improve on the law, but to make the law more appropriate. Um, one thing, first one then is lifnim mishurat adin, that it is strongly recommended in many circumstances to go beyond the requirement of the law. And maybe somebody could prove a case against me, uh, something and uh, whatever, but uh, I have to be generous in, in settlement of, of of whatever it is, and, and generally in obeying the law. Tikkun olam. It's very difficult to translate, and I've used a very awkward translation because it, it's closer to the words, establishing the world aright. Tikkun, the takein, to, to fix something. Um, we'll have to look at contexts in which that becomes relevant. They have another general principle of darkesh shalom, and notice all these are going beyond 613 mitzvot of the Torah. Even if you've got the 613 mitzvot, you still have to apply these broader principles. Uh, seek the ways of peace. Darke noam, ways of pleasantness. That's applied in some cases, darke shalom in others. Then we have the idea of kiddush Hashem, that a person should, uh, I mean, for instance, how should a Talmud Chacham talk to people? He should talk gently and politely and pleasantly. And this makes a Kiddush Hashem. People say, ah, the Torah must be a great thing. This is how it teaches people to talk. Opposite being Chilol Hashem. If he's sort of bad-tempered and surly with people, whatever it is, people say, oh, the Torah must be a terrible thing. This is how it, uh, people are like who follow it. And Mishum Eva. Uh, an example of that would be um, the, the midwife. I, I'm sticking for the moment to examples which are given in the Mishnah and in the Gemara. Mishum Eva, uh, the question of a Jewish midwife uh, birthing a, an idolatrous woman. I'll say idolatrous, it, 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 talking about anybody outside the, the Israelite group. Um, yes. Is she permitted to do that? After all, she's bringing a child into the world to become an idolater. And yes, Mishum Eva, because it would arouse hatred if she refused to birth a non-Jewish woman. This has also been invoked, this principle, in the, with doctors and whether they um, may be Shabbat if they're treating a non-Jewish person and so on. 
a big discussion on that. Um, now, here I'm going to give a few examples from the Mishnah of one of the methods, the method of Tikkun Olam. Uh, where does Tikkun Olam apply? Um, and most of the Tikkun Olam examples are given in Maseket Gitin, in the Mishnah, that sort of collection of such things. Um, if you have the handout, you would find these things actually on the last page. So I'll read some of them. Um, Tikkun Olam. Well. Oh, no, I, I don't think you have this, um, this particular piece. So, right, um, <laughs> stick to this copy. Um, question of inheritance. Uh, according to Torah law, according to the Halakha, if uh, someone dies leaving a family, then what, what happens is that uh, only the sons inherit. Yeah, that's even if there are daughters. And there are ways around this, but the basic halakha is sons inherit. So what provision then is made for, for the widow and for daughters? Well, there are provisions. And the provision for a widow comes through her ketubah. Um, when they were married, he writes out a ketubah, which says in the, um, so much property, property is there and is pledged to her ketubah. Now, Okay, so the person has died and he leaves a widow and children. But there is the practicality of actually taking payment. Maybe the ketubah and whatever it is, it's all in the form of property. So she has to have access to that. And the earlier method was apparently that um, they, the sons would impose on the widow uh, an oath uh, that um, that she had not already uh, taken any of the property because she might have helped herself to something during previous years which would have been deducted from the ketubah. So uh, people, uh, the sons apparently, uh, if they neglected to do that, she couldn't get anything, which put her in a very difficult position. So one of the things that Rabban Gamliel did, and this is, I think, Gamliel the first that we're talking about, he instituted that she should, she, all she did was on, on herself was to make some sort of vow. She would say, I swear uh, I will do so and so if I took anything else from anything in advance from my ketubah. She simply makes the vow and she can then and that fully entitles her to collect the ketubah. So this is a provision which is made for tikkun olam. So we're getting an idea of what tikkun olam means. What is the concept of tikkun olam? Something to make for proper relations between people to get things to work. Likewise, the witnesses on the get. In principle, you wouldn't need witnesses on a get. It's just something that the husband writes out and he... he um, passes it in the presence of witnesses, that's something else. But the signatures of witnesses are not strictly required, but that was done in, because of husbands who would come along subsequently and say, oh, the get, uh, I didn't mean it, and, uh, and somehow find legal means to invalidate the get. To prevent that happening, it was instituted that witnesses should sign. Again, another adjustment of the law made to protect the weak in society. And of course, Hiller's principle, principle, which I mentioned already. So those are examples in the Mishnah of um, institutions which were made as tikkun olam, to make uh, relations among people easier. Then another group, are uh, also in Mishnah of Gitin, are set up as being darke shalom, which is slightly different it's sort of to stop quarrels erupting. Uh, if I would ask you, why do we call up to the Torah, Cohen, then Levi, then Yisrael? And 
it's against the principle, really, the original principle, which was you first call up the most learned. I mean, in fact, there is an almost amusing Mishnah at the end of Masechet Horayot, which talks about precedence, who comes first. And it says, Afilu mamzer talmid chacham kodem lekohen gadol ma'ares. That even a uh, talmid chacham, even if he is, uh, his descent is impure, he's a mamzer, but he's a talmid chacham after all, he's learned. He has precedence over the high priest, if the high priest is an ama'aris, is an ignorant person. Uh, just imagine trying to put that into practice. But if, if presumably at one stage, for reading of the Torah, the, where they would call up first to call, uh, a, a, a Talmud Kacham, and this would be followed afterwards by others. So, um, but we don't do that. We have the Kohen first, then the Levi. Why? Darke Shalom. Because you can just imagine the sort of quarrels which would take place. I should be called up first, he should be called up first, the other one would be a row. <laughs> I've, uh, Mark, uh, I have remarked amusingly that um, the main, uh, the only opposition I would have to equality of women in the synagogue <laughs> would be to extending it to Kriyata Torah, to the calling up. Because uh, what would we do? What order would we have to call people up? But um, uh, that is not a serious remark. And I have been present at services where women were called up and things were sorted out peacefully. OK. Um, another one, Erev. You have people in the, who make an Erev Chatserot. Houses together. Um, where do you place the actual meal, which is the Erev? And I suppose people could follow about that. No, wherever you started it, keep it in the same house. And the next one doesn't apply to us very easily because we all have running water. But imagine you didn't. And you have to have the water piped by an aqueduct and then put into wells, whatever it is. And you can imagine the quarrels which could take place among neighbors who gets the water first. So the well nearest to the aqueduct takes water first, it's ways of peace. Then there are questions about fishing, fishing nets and things, animals which are caught or trapped, who do they belong to? And uh, Yose, there are some cases here where Rabbi Yose disagrees and says, you know, this isn't a question of Darke Shalom. This is the strict law that the person in whose net the fish has come has the right to it and so on. And uh, one should not prevent poor non-Jews from, from taking the gleanings or the leket shechopea, the various things which are left in the field. So that's Darke Shalom. Uh, one more thing I'm going to talk about before stopping for questions, and that is the rabbinic invention of the goy, as we say. Uh, you must be struck if you read the Torah. The word goy uh, has no pejorative tone at all uh, as it's used in the Torah, it's used of everybody. Abraham will be a goy gadol, will be a great goy, a great nation. Uh, somehow the word has changed its meaning over time and it came to mean the undifferentiated other. Uh, the nation is applied to everybody. Seven nations of Canaan, a distinct class, and a other, another nation is given a different status. The gay is also a non-Israelite. But the rabbis then lump together all non-Israelites as goyim, and usually the expression they use is not goyim, but akum, although we don't know all the time which expression is used because censors have interfered with the text as they've been uh, transmitted. Um, so uh, you, this creates, and this has consequences in halakha, which have caused an awful lot of trouble over the ages. Um, I, I would recommend to you the book which is listed, uh, given their detail in Ophir. This book came out in about uh, three years ago now, on the which is on the Goy, on Israel's multiple others and the birth of the Gentile, which has very carefully studied, particularly the rabbinic period in the Middle Ages on this. Um, this concept of everybody else lumped together as Akum created no end of trouble 
throughout the Middle Ages. And I've given you three examples here of, well, two examples of ways around that and another one uh, which relates to it. The first one is Rabbeinu Tam in, in the 12th century in Troyes in what is now France. Uh, and the problem there was the following, that according to the Mishnah in Bukharot, um, you're not allowed to form a partnership with a goy, with an akum. Well, by this time in France, partnerships with non-Jews in the commercial world were actually very common. How can that be justified? The reason given in, in the Talmud is because it would lead to somebody taking an oath in the name of an idol. So Rabbeinu Tam picks up on, on a suggestion which had already been made, and in fact it's well known among Muslims, the concept of, uh, in Arabic, shirk, but in Hebrew, shituf. Uh, yes, he said, your Christian partner might come to take an oath, but it's not an oath to an idol, really, because it's partly it's an oath to God, and partly it's an oath in the name of something else, the saints or, or whatever it is. So that is called shituf, it's association, and goyim are not forbidden to do that. So nothing terrible would happen as a consequence. But the fact is that Rabbeinu Tam has justified a change in the law. He hasn't changed the law. The law was in effect changed, but he's given a justification for it. The person who's probably most famous about this is uh, another rabbi in what, part of what is now France, uh, but down south, um, Menachem Meiri, whose commentaries mostly came, only became known in the course of the 20th century. We've forgotten for a long time. So Meiri's commentary on the Talmud is noted for its position on the status of Gentiles in Jewish law. And he simply says that um, discriminatory laws and statements found in the Talmud only apply to the idolatrous nations of old, and he clearly does not regard his Christian neighbors as idolaters in, in that sense. Therefore, those laws don't apply. Um, another extension uh, to the law which is made in the Middle Ages is by Ramban. Of course, Ramban is one of the particularists, rather the universalists in, in terms of law. And uh, what he says about these two cases is, is another matter. But he does apply uh, quite sweepingly the principle of Hatov Bahayashah, not as one of the 613 mitzvot, but as a general principle to be applied when interpreting the law. It's something like Litni Mishurit Adin. So these are the ways which are found to extend the law. And I think all of these are important in the context of an organization like Uri Tzedek, which is practicing its charity, its benevolence, its help to the, out to the world as a whole, not just within the Jewish world. How can we do that? Yes, we do not look on the nations outside as akum, as idolaters in the old sense, and we have precedent for refusing to do this and for taking a much broader view. So, uh, my, let me sum up my reflections here. The traditional sources do contain some material which now we find shocking. To deny that would be dishonest, and covering up by far-fetched interpretations isn't much better. Some instances may be understood, though not necessarily condoned in historical context. We might say, oh, we understand why when the Israelites entered the Promised Land, they had to get rid of all those, smash up all the idols and do the rest of it. Yeah, uh, there is some mileage in that. Uh, I'm not entirely satisfied with it. We must frankly admit that our sources contain some unacceptable material, noting that much of this is opposed within the sources themselves. That is, we see that different views are presented throughout Tanakh, particularly in relationship to the outside world. And this is a challenge for us. We have to select which routes, that's why I've put a small prompt growing up, it's for us to grow the right routes and apply them in the situation in which we live. Conclusion, we cannot uncritically turn to religious sources for an unqualified statement of universal human rights and dignity, because our sources assume different societies and often incorporate opposing views. 
you can find pointers towards the type of values which we wish to embrace. The Torah has presented its values specifically with relation to the Jewish people because it assumes a fragmented world. This is not our world. We live in, a, in an interdependent world where all people have to work together. And that is why we have to extrapolate from the rules and values in the Torah and apply them much more broadly to the integrated world in which separatism is not a real option for us. And finally, a beautiful quotation, Olam Chesed Yibaneh, in the Psalms, the world is built on kindness. But to do this, you must be bold. And if I would put in a single sentence, what is it that um, distinguishes modern orthodoxy from Haredi Judaism at this time? And I'm far from wanting to elect a barrier, but there are clearly are differences. And I think that the principal difference is the recognition of change in the world and the necessity to adjust and to apply our values as broadly as possible um, throughout the world of which we are part. And to do this, you have to be bold. So, the Shana Tova, Tikatevu, Betekatevu. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So, I'd like to open it up for some questions. Did anyone have any questions for Rabbi Norman Solomon? Yeah. Um, Rabbi Solomon. So, uh, I'm Chaim Seidler. I wanted to thank you very much. Um, I want to I want to make a comment and then ask you a question. Uh, the comment is, um, that a, a sort of an over an overarching change that occurred and that was consciously achieved by Mazel was the abol uh, abolition of prophecy as an authoritative source. It seems to me that 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 under that underlies the capacity for reason and human experience to be a control over the, uh, for, for all the principles that you introduce. In other words, that, that the revelation itself uh, seems to be overridden in the, it, it, as, 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 as the, you know, in the rabbi's minds. Um, maybe, maybe that's a too broad a, a, a subject to raise, but uh, I, I think that it's, it's a radical, it's radical. Um, it's, it's, Prophecy. Yes. Uh, may I respond to you straight away? Uh, a, a great, difficult, a great and important and difficult question. Uh, my own approach to it, which I won't develop now, because I've just finished, almost finished writing a book which has something to say on it, uh, comes back to the question of language. We say prophecy came to an end. And uh, I maintain that no. It didn't. We are using quite different language. Where do we gain access to knowledge of uh, what is right to do? If I just, just put it in very simple language like that. Uh, in the time of the prophets, there were individuals who claim divine inspiration. If I have an inspiration, I am not going to put it in that sort of word, I will not say, oh, God called me in the night and told me X, Y, Z. It doesn't happen like that. Um, another generation came and they didn't talk like that. The rabbis came and they did innovate. They don't like to call it innovation, but they certainly did. And I've given you many examples of it. They said, oh, we are interpreting. That was the generation of the interpreters. But in fact, I think we passed the generation of the interpreters as well. If we simply repeat the words that the earlier interpreters did, we will produce a lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to use the resources that are available to us, which include a much better understanding of, of history, of society, of situations, and we have to apply that. If this sounds perilously close to reform, well, I'm afraid 
uh, it sounds perilously close. It is. Where we draw the line, I don't know. It is the communities of the future which are going to decide where that line is. I'm personally very much against putting lines between different branches of Judaism, but it's happened, and there we are. Yeah. Well, if, if I might, uh, thank you. I, I, I have more to say, but I, I wanted to ask you a, another question about um, what, what was achieved, because you, you raised the question, there are some uh, difficult um, um, uh, uh, laws uh, that, that are introduced, at, for instance, in the context of the land. Now, uh, one of the problems is that in the, in the process of, uh, refer of reform that's introduced, uh, let's say, by Basan Cherev, Uber at Kol Alam Kulo, nevertheless, the original remains on the books. And 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 we, I, I, my sense is, we don't dare to say that's what's on the books is itself immoral. But if we don't say that, then we allow it to remain an operative category, and people are using it today. That's the problem. It's arisen again in a practical context. Can we move to the to the point you're talking about development and new understandings? But actually say from our perspective to maintain that practice would be immoral because uh, yeah, so this, is, you know, this is precisely what, what i'm trying to say uh, we have to do that we have to be honest about it and we have to be bold and say so um, not hide behind interpretations and uh, you know. uh, and I, among the changes that we must embrace and which haredim i know find so difficult uh, is the awareness of change within history and of accumulating knowledge. We have to embrace the knowledge which is there. I mean, it's nonsense to do otherwise. You know, I mean, if, to bring the conversation down to a, a, a much lower level, um, a, a simple level. I, I mean, I, I was with my wife a few years ago. I, we, we were traveling to, I think it was Norway. We wanted to see the the uh, the midnight sun. So, uh, I we get in a taxi for the, to the airport, and as one does, one chats with the taxi driver. Where are you going? We're going to Norway. What are you going to see? The midnight sun. Huh? What's that? So I explain. Well. You know, it's because of the way that, that the Earth revolves. What do you mean the Earth revolves? If it revolved, everything would fall off. And he was quite serious. Now, I know where this guy was educated. <laughs> Probably Pakistan, actually. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it, 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 uh, but would the great rabbis have said anything very different if somebody told them the Earth is spinning? You see? I, the world has changed, and we've got to take this on board. And when we read the Torah, we must be able to accept that and not get away with saying it's all exactly true and everything fits with everything else. It doesn't. We will find a much more powerful Torah that way. Wonderful. Thank you for those questions. Does anyone have one last question before we wrap up? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, my name's Garrett Steenblick. I uh, work in interfaith activities in Phoenix, Arizona. I am I'm curious to know how you would situate the story in Genesis chapter nine within the context of some of the people, some of the scholars I've read suggest that the Genesis nine story about uh, the curse upon one of Noah's grandsons uh, following the event in the vineyard after the flood uh, was really not applied as a in a racial sort of context until sometime after the exile. Uh, that it was only after the Babylonian exile that people began to associate that in any way with African Africans or people of African descent or of black descent. But it certainly is one of the texts that perhaps the Jews have not turned to, but that. Could return to to justify intolerance, racism, and prejudice. 
Uh, yes, the text has been used in that way uh, quite recently in, in, in South Africa before the end of apartheid. I mean, it was quite often uh, used uh, to justify apartheid. And uh, before that, it was very commonly read as um, denoting the inferiority of black races, you might say. Okay, um, there are two ways out of this. One is what I think is a rather devious way of saying, well, no, it only applied to so and so and so and so, and you, you interpret it away. But I think we have to face it, it's there. And this, this isn't the way we do things, and it's not what we're going to follow. Simple as that. Um, it didn't surface, uh, fortunately, <laughs> in, uh, among the 613 mitzvot, so uh, we are exempt from that. But um, yes, it's done a lot of harm. Okay, is there any last question? We only have time for one more and then that's it. No? Well, then thank you so much for everyone who has attended here today. Um, to Rabbi Norman Solomon for this wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. It was such an honor. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to join us in these sessions. Take care, everyone. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And the Shana Tovati Katevu Bye.